All right. Appreciate everyone being here this morning. Now, the sermon topic for this morning is not a pleasant one, but sometimes we have to preach things that are not very pleasant because they're found in the Word of God and they're very important for us to know and understand, in, and especially in the world that we live in today. We started off reading Judges chapter 20. But the story that, that is happening in the book of Judges, we kind of picked up halfway into it, or actually the second half of what really happened. It starts in Judges chapter 19. Now I'm be focusing in a little bit more on the reaction and the response to what happened in Judges chapter 19. But even in Judges chapter 20, what happened in Judges chapter 19 is kind of glossed over a little bit. When, when they're, the children of Israel gather together and they're going to fight against Benjamin. And they're going to fight against the wicked men of Gibeah. And when they're re recounting what happened, you could see in chapter 20 verse number 5. It says, And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me, and my concubine have they forced that she is dead. So this is his recounting of the story of what happened, but this doesn't even go into the great detail of what actually did happen in Judges chapter 19. And just to see to, to what, what, why such a serious response is given, we're going to look back at Judges chapter 19 really quickly here, and we're going to see what happened. Again, this is a very upsetting story, but it's found in the Word of God and something that we need to be reminded of that this exists and, and we need to be reminded of the type of people that exist in this world and who they are and what they do and what they're all about. Right. Judges chapter 19, we're going to look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men... Now, when it says their hearts merry, this is talking about a man and his concubine who was staying in this area. They were strangers. They were traveling home. It was getting late. They had to find a place to sleep for the night. So they go into the city. Nobody is welcoming them in. They're just going to stay out in the street all night. An old man returns from the field. He's out working. He invites them into his house. He says, no, 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 no. Don't stay in the street. Like, don't, do not stay in the street. Just come into my house. We'll put you up for the night. No big deal. So they go into this man's house. And they're eating. They're having fellowship. You know, they're just enjoying each other's company. It says, now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial. Belial is a false god. Basically, it's Satan. Some, some extremely wicked men. It says, certain sons of Belial beset the house round about and beat at the door. And spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. See, in Judges chapter 20, he says, Oh, they just tried to kill me, and then they forced my concubine and, and killed her. <coughs> Which is extremely wicked as it is. But he doesn't even mention the fact that when the men just gathered around the house, the mob of, of these satanic, wicked men... They're beating on the door saying, hey, bring that man out to us that we may know him. They weren't interested in his concubine. They weren't interested in women. What were they interested in? They're interested in a man. Why? Because they're homos. They're fags. They're sodomites. And I'm sorry if that language offends you. Actually, I'm not sorry about it. Because if that language offends you, you've been brainwashed by this world. The Bible tells us. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse number 13, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That is the way that God feels about homosexuality or sodomites in the Bible, that it deserves a death penalty. And we see two stories in the Bible, two stories that specifically reference men that want to, to have a relationship with another man and in both stories, Genesis 19 and Judges 19, it is just extreme wickedness. And these people are perverted and vile and abusers and just, just the worst of the worst. Genesis 19, of course, is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know how that happened. God rains down fire and brimstone upon Sodom. Why? Because of their wickedness. Because their wickedness is so exceeding great that it got up to heaven. And God's like, he sent his angels not to save them, but to destroy them. And you remember in that story, ironically, how similar it is. Because what happened? The angels of the Lord come in 
to Sodom. And what happens? Lot invites them into, her, into his house, right? Same exact scenario. Oh no, don't stay in the streets. Come into my house. What are they doing? They sit down, they have some food, they eat some dinner. Men of the city surround the house, start beating on the door. Hey, bring those men out that we may know them. It's the same exact story. <coughs> this is what the Sodomite is really about. This is who they really are. And when they get in numbers and enough force, see, right now they want to play off as just being these, these harmless, little effeminate, you know, you can laugh at them, you know, make jokes about them or whatever. But when they get strong enough in numbers, their true identity is going to come out. What they're, what, what they're really about comes out. In both of these situations, you had a lot of sodomites in one place. And they get bold enough to then just come out and be like, we're just going to surround this house and we're going to make them come out and we're just going to have our way with them. The homosexual is a predator. The Bible, God's word is very specific and is teaching us and you will not find anything other than that in scripture. How do you think that there are any to begin with anyways? They don't reproduce. People aren't born a sodomite. You're not born homosexual. They go out and they recruit them. They defile it. That's why you run into all these people, all these perverts. What happened to them? They were defiled as a, as a child. They were defiled when they were younger. They ended up hating God, and then they become one of these <coughs> filthy reprobates. <clears throat> but that's just the groundwork. What, what I want to cover this morning is the response. Because this wickedness happens in Judges 19. And what happens is that, you know, they, they, they surround the house, they beat on the house, they try to get to the guy, and, you know, they're just like, no, you know, basically they appease them by sending forth his concubine out to them. Now, that was not a right thing to do. That was not right. Just because people did that in the Bible doesn't mean that that was the right thing to do. But that's what they did. They got scared. I mean, they were surrounded by these, these people, so they sent out this woman. Instead of sending out the man, they sent out the woman, and they abused her all night long until she died. She died on the, on the doorstep. That shows how implacable and unmerciful these people are, like Romans 1 describes. Read Romans 1 about the people who have, who have uh, not natural affections, and then you get down to the end of chapter 1, and it'll give you all of the attributes, how full of wickedness that they are. But that's what we see happen in this story. So what happens is then this, this man <coughs> takes his concubine and he actually cuts her up into pieces and he sends part portions of her deceased body throughout all the nation of Israel and kind of gives the story and says, here's what happened. Israel, what are we going to do about this? What, what, how are we going to deal with this level of wickedness? What is to be done about this. Now the children of Israel, in this situation, this is one of their own tribes. This happened in the tribe of Benjamin. And the reason why he even chose to stay in that place is because he had another choice to stay in another city. He's like, no, no, no. We're not going to stay there because they're not of the children of Israel. We're going to go among our own people and we're going to stay there because he figured it would be safer for them. But he goes in into a place that should be friendly and this wickedness happens. So now they have to decide what they're going to do. They decide they have to fight against their own brothers, their own people. And they come together as one man, the Bible says, in unity against this wickedness. <coughs> I want you to turn to, uh, we're in Judges 20. Look at verse number one. It says, Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord and Mizpe. Then jump down to verse number seven. It says, Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. 
And we will take 10 men of an hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel and a hundred of a thousand and a thousand out of 10,000 to fetch vittle for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. They were all unified in their response to this wickedness. What's the application here? Well, this is, the, this is supposed to be the children of Israel, the children of God, right? God's people, when they hear about something so wicked being done among them, what is their response? Well, they're all, they're, there is no doubt. There's no debate about this. They don't have to have a discussion and say, well, I don't know. Is this right? Well, I don't know. What would God have us to do? They come together as one man. Would to God, God's people of today, the believers in the Lord, Christians would be able to come together as one man against this type of wickedness and not have debates of, well, I don't know. Well, we just need to love everybody and just bring everybody in the house and just love, have a big love fest. That's not what the Bible teaches. Would to God we could get together as one man regarding this wickedness of the vile reprobates that were meant to be taken and destroyed, the Bible says. Real men of God are not tolerant of this type of wickedness. You know, this world's going to try to brainwash you. Oh, we need to be tolerant of everybody. Toler tolerate all this sin. Tolerate everything. No. We're not to tolerate this wickedness. The Bible says, I went over this last week or two weeks ago in Psalms. Keep your place here in Judges 20. We're coming back to it. If you want to look real quick in Psalm 15. And if you want more on this subject, you could go back and, and go on the internet and find the, the sermon that I preached on Psalm 15. <coughs> Psalm 15 starts off saying, Lord, who shall abide in that tabernacle? Who shall dwell in that holy hill? It's about staying right with God, staying in God's house, staying in God's place. How are you going to do that? It says, he that walketh uprightly, worketh righteousness. Jump down to verse number four and then it says, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. That word contemned means hated. Yes, there is a righteous hatred. Now, it is not something you should just have your life full of hatred and just be hating all the time. No, of course we should have love, but we need to have the right balance. Ecclesiastes, the Bible says, there's a time for war and a time of peace. There's a time to love and a time to hate. A righteous person, according to Psalm 15, it says a vile person is contemned. I went through that whole sermon. I brought up all these references to when the word vile is used in Scripture. Because vile is not just some light word. It's not some word that just tossed around and applied to everything. The word vile is applied to very specific people. It's applied to reprobates. It's applied to people who hate God. Vile means absolutely disgusting or gut-wrenching. <laughs> it's really interesting. I was out soul winning last week, and, and I, had a, I had a pretty good discussion with this guy. But he was a younger guy. He was in his early 20s. And I was, I was, he, he brought up, it's interesting the way everything worked out, but we ended up getting on the discussion uh, uh, talking about reprobates, okay, which is not something I normally do when I go out soul winning because I'm just trying to preach the gospel, just trying to get people saved. But it, but it was an issue that needed to be dealt with. It was something that had to be dealt with. It, it, was, it was important given this discussion. And um, I started showing them Romans chapter 1 and explaining that and, and explaining how the Bible says that these people, that when, it, when it's man with man doing that which is unseemly, it says that they're doing things that are against nature. It's against nature. And I said, doesn't it just turn your stomach? If you were to see a man and a man in front of you right now, and they were to start making out or do something like that, wouldn't that just turn your stomach and just be revolting? Right. Wouldn't that just be disgusting and sexy? We all have a sin nature. We're prone to do things like tell lies or steal, or, or you know, commit some other type of sin, naturally, in our flesh. 
But there's some things that you are not just prone to doing. You are not just like, it's not just like you wake up one day and you're going to end up committing some vile act with someone of the same, the same sex as you. It's not going to happen. It's against nature. And <clears throat> as I was talking to this guy, as I said, he was a younger guy. I said, and I brought that up and he's like, well, you know, whatever. He's just like, well, they do whatever they want to do. And I was just like, wouldn't that just turn to somebody? He's like, I don't know. It's like, you've been brainwashed. Oh, no, I haven't been brainwashed. Yes, you have. You've been desensitized to this sin. Why? Because Hollywood, music, the media, everyone is trying to cram down your throats that this really isn't that bad. It's just an alternative lifestyle, that it's really just something that needs to be tolerated and accepted, and we just need to love them. That's what's being promoted. <coughs> <clears throat> And if you're not in this book more than you're receiving the things of this world, you will be influenced by that. And you have all these, look, I stopped watching TV and movies and stuff that Hollywood put out, I don't know how long ago, at least a decade. Over a decade. So I don't know any more on everything that's being pumped out there, but I know when I was watching on a regular basis all the movies that came out, all the worldly music, everything, how bad things were getting. And you can see the slide. And if you think back in your head, you can see when was the first time that even on television, there was even any type of mention to someone who was a homosexual in a, in a TV show or in a movie. It was very rare. Go back to the 70s or 80s. Probably some of the earliest ones I can remember would be like Mr. R or, you know, like Three's Company or whatever. He had a character that was kind of faggy. He was kind of effeminate. And you go back to you know, certain, certain shows like that where they would start to, to throw it off as just being comical and just making fun of. But then it gets into the 80s and 90s when you have shows like Ellen come out and then it's just like, well, we've just got this sodomite and they're the main character. And just getting, and, and that was shocking. And that was like taken off the air. Oh no, we can't have that. And now what do you have? Now you have even more filth being pumped in front of the people's heads. Why? Because it's this gradual desensitizing to wickedness. Because the reaction comes out, oh, no way, I can't see that. But then you just keep allowing, you keep putting the same stuff in front of your face. Then it becomes not as big of a deal. That's the way Satan works. That's the way wickedness works. And as I said, when you're not spending time in this book, and you see how God deals with things, see how the people of God should be dealing with things, and you're just seeing what Satan wants you to see and what the world wants you to understand, then you will be influenced by this. Any normal person should naturally be revolted <clears throat> by those types of actions. The children of Israel at this point, they were in good standing with God. This is still very shortly after Moses leads them out of the wilderness and Joshua leads them on to great victory. They're right with God at this point and they see something so vile. They're like, this hasn't even been seen. Like, like I, how can this possibly happen among the children of Israel? So what do they do? They decide to go out and fight. So we're not going to tolerate this. We're not going to allow this to happen. And the title of my sermon this morning is The Price of Eradicating Wickedness. Because this is not an easy battle, as you see from this story. This is not something that's won and done. They have to keep fighting against this. They actually suffer losses in this battle. It is of God. They seek counsel of God all along the way, yet we still see that they suffer defeats. They suffer some losses. But the, the, the price is worth it. And unfortunately, today, people aren't understanding the price and, and how it's worth it. You know, we hear all day long, you know, freedom isn't free. Okay, amen. We know, you know, that, that, that people will, will talk about our military and say, you know, we have to fight. And, and in this country especially, there's a history of, of it, you know, exalting freedom and liberty. And saying, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a heavy price tag in order to have that, right? 
But I'm not talking about freedom and liberty this morning. I'm talking about righteousness with God and godly standards and actual morals because there's a price to pay for that also. If you just turn your back and decide, I don't want to get in this fight, the world around you is just going to go to hell in a handbasket. We need people to be able to stand up as the children of Israel did and come together with one man and just be like, we're not going to tolerate this. This is not going to happen. Because we know what happens when you allow this wickedness to happen. You don't even have to be a believer in God's word to see what happens all throughout history. What has happened to the decadent societies that have turned into homosexuality and this bastion of filth? What happens to that nation? Every single time without fail, they're destroyed, wiped out completely. Look at the Greek Empire. Look at the Roman Empire. Look at these places that were known for having such perversion and wickedness. They get stamped out. Or in the case of Sodom, just burnt with fire and brimstone. It happens without fail. In this story, these people get wiped out. The Benjamites are, are almost completely annihilated. Almost completely. As a result of what happens here. But there is a cost involved. What we see in Judges chapter 20, there's 26,700 men of Benjamin. And there's 400,000 men of Israel that come, soldiers, to fight. That's a lopsided battle. You have 400,000, we'll call them, you know, righteous people, standing up for God, standing up for righteousness. <coughs> and 26,700 that are not. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this, look at verse number 12. We'll start reading there. Look at verse number 12 in chapter 20, Judges 20, 12. And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin saying, what wickedness is this that is done among you? Now, therefore, deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. So they go to Benjamin and they say, hey, look, we're gathered together. Give us just the real, those wicked people, the men of Gibeah, you know, they need to be put to death. That's God's punishment. We're going we're gonna to stand here. We're going to make sure that God's will is done, that they are executed because they have done wickedness and we're not going to tolerate that in our land. So to deliver them unto us that justice may be served. But what does Benjamin do? They refuse. They side with the wicked people. They side with the Sodomites. It says, but the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel, but the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities under Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. They sided with them so much to say, no, we're going to fight against you. Watch out for the people that are going to take the side of the homos over the side of the Christians. Watch out for the people that want to be sensitive and, and, and just tolerant of all the wickedness. And they're going to fight against the people who are going to preach righteousness from the word of God. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of them out there today because this isn't the first time I preach on this subject. And a lot of people, look, this ruffles feathers and this gets people upset because of the, the, the day that we live in. And it's unfortunate and it's sad that people can't love the word of God enough to say, you know what, I'm going to believe the Bible and I don't care what anybody thinks about this. I don't care who's going to attack me. But look, it happens. I get attacked from people who are supposedly Christians for this type of a stance. And they'd rather stand with the people that hate God than stand with someone who loves God. Israel, they just wanted to execute the wicked reprobates that deserve death penalty. But Benjamin starts defending them and they take their side. Look at verse number 18. So now they decide, what are we going to do? Because now it comes to, this is going to be a battle. We're going to have to fight against our own brothers. And the children of Israel rose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? Now, it's interesting when they, when they go to God, they already know that it's God's will to go out and fight against them. He's just saying, well, who's going to go up first? And God answers them and confirms, yes, you are going to go out to battle and Judah's going to go up first. This is what I want to have done. You are going to do the right thing. You will go out to battle against this wickedness. Verse number 21, the Bible says, And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day, 20 and 2,000. 
men. That is significant loss. So you've got 400,000 soldiers that are coming to battle against Benjamin. Benjamin had 26,700 men to fight. So almost every single man of Benjamin killed one person out of, the, out of Israel, and we don't see any losses suffered from Benjamin. I'm not saying there weren't any, but nothing notable. They suffered 22,000 people lost in that attack, in a righteous attack, what they were supposed to be doing out of the mouth of God, under the direction of the Lord. So they asked counsel of God again. Because you figure, hey, we're doing the right thing for God. You know what? What's going on here? I thought we would just defeat him right away. And oftentimes we, we get that mentality too. Now look, if you're doing God's will and if you're fighting for the Lord, it's the right battle, it's the right fight. But you can't look at your immediate circumstances and just think all of a sudden, well, maybe I'm not right with God. Sometimes battles, especially battles that are worth fighting, it's going to take a little while. It's not going to be over in a minute. It's not going to be over immediately. It's going to require investment. It's going to require some time. But they go to God again. Again, this is great. There's nothing wrong with asking counsel again. Just going to seek God's uh, approval. Verse number 23. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And look, they're still, they're still concerned because, hey, this is one of us. This is our, our brethren. But this wickedness we can't deal with. Should we go up? And the Lord said, go up against him. So they're doing what's right. Again, so, yep, go up and fight. Verse number 25, And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel. Again, 18,000 men. All these drew the sword. So between the first two days of battle, they lose 40,000 40, men give their lives. Wow. That's a lot of people. 40,000 men give their lives to this cause, to eradicate wickedness out of the land. That's serious. I mean, we, and you ought to take things like that serious. You know, we shouldn't be a nation, or we're turning into one, that goes into war, wars flippantly, right? Because the value of life is really, really high. We shouldn't just be going to wars with people over the stupidest of reasons or just getting involved in all these entanglements. Look, war is a serious issue. War is a big deal. When people are putting their lives on the line, it should be for a really serious cause. And this is a cause that the Bible says that God himself said, yes, I want you to go out and fight this battle. And it's worth it. It's worth the loss. It's worth the 40,000 lives that have been slain to win this fight. Now, they could have given up after that first loss. They could have given up after that second loss, but they didn't. They go to God again. They ask counsel a third time. Verse number 26, Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. For the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. And that's exactly what happens. God does then deliver them that day. But we see the laws. And now Phineas, if you know the story of Phineas, Phineas was, was another stand-up guy that, that stood firm on the word of God. Phineas is the one that took the javelin and smote it through the Midianite woman. He wouldn't allow wickedness to come into the camp. Phineas is a, is a righteous man here. They're in a righteous battle. They go up and they fight again. Look, at, jump down to verse number 35. It says, And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed of the Benjamites that day twenty and five thousand and and hundred men. All these drew the sword. So this final day, this third day of battle, 25,100 of Benjamin were defeated. Remember, they started out with 26,700. So that leaves 1,100 men left. And as you read on, you know, go through the rest of that story, 
you're going to see that even more died. There is less than a thousand men left. Why? God brings the victory. They were doing the right thing. And ultimately, in the end, God brings forth the victory. But he's, he's showing a lot of things here. I believe that this fight isn't necessarily going to be an easy one. When you're trying to eradicate wickedness, now turn if you would to Luke chapter 14. It's the last place I have you turned this morning. Luke chapter 14. When you're trying to eradicate wickedness and you're fighting a fight like this, you may suffer losses. There may be fierce opposition to this. There may be fierce opposition even among the people of God because Benjamin was still of God's people. But the men of Gibeah were extremely wicked. They're the ones that, the, the whole tribe of Benjamin didn't do this wickedness, but they sided with the wrong people. They sided with the Sodomite brethren of theirs instead of siding with God and with the rest of God's people. Fighting against this type of wickedness is a serious battle. It is. But it's worth fighting. We need to stand firm on the word of God. We need to stand firm for what is true and what is right. If you care at all about future generations, you will fight this fight. I have five young children back there. I do not want them to live in a modern day Sodom. And I'm going to do my best to make sure that they're not going to live in a wicked, dangerous, filthy, perverted society. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fight against it today. And I'm going to keep fighting against it. And I'm going to scream about it. And I'm going to quote scripture all day long and say, thus saith the Lord. It's abominable. It's vile. It's filthy. They should be hated. And according to the Bible, put to death. Now, Every time, I got to make mention of this because someone's always going to try to twist your words out of context. We don't believe in vigilante justice, but the, the way that the Bible prescribes human government to be operated, he gives punishments for various crimes, and these are the punishments that, we ought, that ought to be enacted by the government today. It's not the responsibility of an individual to go and seek vengeance for crimes that are done. However, the righteous punishment we can find according to God. If you think that something that God said in his law is not right, then you are judging God. The Bible says that a kidnapper should be put to death. Oh, I don't think it's that big of a crime. You're wrong. Because God thinks it's that big of a crime. The Bible says that adulterers ought to be put to death. Oh, what's the big deal? Everyone's going out and committing adultery these days. You don't think it's that big of a deal? You're wrong. Because God thought it was a big deal and God prescribed a death penalty for adultery. That's a righteous judgment because it comes from God. And if a man lies with mankind as he lies with woman, they've committed abomination, they shall surely be put to death according to God's word. Say, I don't think that that should be the punishment. You're wrong. God's right. I'm not going to judge God's laws. Be like, oh no, that's not, that's actually, that, I can't believe that that, that would be a, a good judgment, a good punishment. You may not be able to believe it. I believe it. I believe, I believe God knows about right and wrong more than I do, and more than you do. And I'm going to trust his word. Luke 14. <coughs> We're closing. Luke 14, verse number 26. Bible says, <clears throat> if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Before we keep reading here, this is, talk, this is Jesus Christ talking about discipleship. There's a difference between being a disciple and a believer. Anyone can put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive salvation as a free gift. It's eternal life. You can never lose that gift. Amen and amen. Being saved is easy. All, all you have to do, it's, Jesus says it's as easy as, you know, taking a drink of water. It's as easy as walking through a door. It's as easy as taking a piece of bread. It's as easy as receiving a free gift. It's easy. Being a disciple, on the other hand, is not easy. 
Being a disciple means you are actually following in the steps of Jesus. It means you're actually doing something. It means you are working. We don't believe in works salvation. Salvation is a free gift. But after you get saved, if you want to be righteous, if you want to live godly, if you want to walk in the ways of Jesus Christ, that is difficult. And he's explaining how difficult that is. He's saying, hey, you come to me, you don't hate your father or mother. You know, basically, he's saying, if, if I'm not first, if I'm not first in your life, that you don't even love your own life more than me, then you can't be my disciple. Jesus has to be first in your life in order for, him to be, for, for you to be his disciple. Verse number 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross. What's, cro what's he talking about there? It's a burden to work. Jesus Christ literally bear his cross. He said, if you do not bear your cross and come after me, you cannot be my disciple. Again, not an easy work to do. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king goeth to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Hey, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear this morning. There's a battle raging in our country, in our area. There is wickedness that is just trying to come in and take over and pervert the land. There's a cost involved. You may not have to physically give your life as the, as the men did in Judges, but you know what you are going to have to be willing to give up? Friendships and relationships with people, they're going to hate you because you believe the word of God, because they so strongly want to side with the perverts of this world that they're willing to fight against you. We need to be willing to stand up and just say, I'm not going to count my life dear to me or anyone else. I'm not going to put anyone else before Jesus Christ. In his word, I'm going to stand for what's right. And maybe there is a cost involved. Maybe I do have to suffer a little bit. Maybe I do have to bear a cross. But it's worth it. It's worth it to fight for the, for the Lord. It's worth it to not tolerate certain things. It's worth it for our children's sake. And it's worth it, most of all, for the, to, to serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for <clears throat> the clear instructions that we receive from your word. Dear Lord, it's a, it's a topic, unfortunately, that's not being preached against loudly enough these days. And there's, there's a lack of knowledge across America among believers these days. People aren't just picking up their Bibles and reading it and reading all these various stories. And, the, and there's too many preachers that are afraid to touch on the subject because they're worried they might offend somebody. Well, Lord, your word doesn't offend me, and I hope it doesn't offend anyone in this room. I hope we can all come together as one man and say, yeah, this is wicked. This is disgusting. This is perverted. This is vile. This is refuse. And we're not going to tolerate it. We're not just going to sit by silently while the, the vocal minority of perverts want to go out and just scare everybody into submission and, and threaten and, and scare to take away you know, their jobs or to shame them publicly or whatever. I don't care about any of that because I'm going to stand for what's right. And it just as Jesus said, you know, hey, when men cast out your name as evil and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, he says that we're blessed and that we could, we could jump and leap for joy in that day. And we need to keep that mindset and remember that whatever, whatever apparent losses we may, we may seem to face in this battle, it's, the, the fight is worth it. And that we're going we're gonna to be your disciples and we're going to stand for the truth. Dear Lords, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.